All right, um, welcome today to uh, my session, Monitoring in 2017. I'll talk about the challenges of monitoring a, a containerized infrastructure and uh, more generally a dynamic infrastructure. I, uh, I'm Charlie, uh, I've been working at Datadog for two years now, and before starting talking about anything, can I take a quick poll? Uh, could you raise your hand if you've heard of Datadog uh, so far? This is amazing. Cool, uh, so I, uh, I started two years ago with the solutions engineering team. I was sent to Australia to build off our, uh, our entity there, and now I joined the software engineering team to work on containerized infrastructures and how we can get the good observability of uh, dynamic infrastructures. So quick, just overview of Datadog. Um, we are a SaaS product. Um, we helped you to get uh, all your data from all the levels of your infrastructure in a single pane glass, and uh, we integrate with, uh, with the services from your cloud providers to um, services uh, for like, I don't know, uh, web servers, et cetera, to other monitoring tools. Now, the plan of today would be to give you a quick crash course of why it's important to monitor, and then I'll talk about the challenges of monitoring a dynamic infrastructure. Um, I'll talk about more Generally, how we find a signal when we monitor, and uh, I'll talk specifically about monitoring um, dynamic infrastructures with the containers in, um, in particular. And I'll, I'll conclude my demo with, uh, or my talk with a demo of a project I had a few weeks ago. So, <clears throat> I'd like to share a metaphor with you. To me, driving a car, well, you rely heavily on your dashboard to get. Uh, in insights like the velocity of your car um, or you know the, the gas level but you also rely on your wipers to clean out um, if it's raining when we when we have an application or a service or an infrastructure without monitoring it's like driving a car without the dashboard without the wipers and, and it's pouring rain everything is on fire so just to uh, talk about that collecting data is really cheap and really easy um, it's not having the data when you need it that is a problem. Now there is a trade-off. When you collect all the data, you can draw into you know, the ocean of, of information that you have. And the key is to identify what you need and exploit it properly. Indeed, observability is not enough. It is one key component of alerting and being aware of the health of your infrastructure but it's not enough. You need monitoring and you need to know what kind of metric, what kind of event, service check, log, et cetera, you need to rely on to be aware of what's happening. Now on top of observing and um, monitoring, we also need to use other components, such as alerting. Alerting comes into flavors, I like to say. The first one is um, actually alerting on, you know, the whether a metric went above a threshold or if you received 5 million uh, 5xx from your servers. It also comes with um, the meta, meta information. Was my team impacted by all the alerts? I need to know if the sprint uh, will not be achieved just because we received so many alerts. So when it comes to alerting, you need to, um, of course, focus on the actual alerts, but also on the impact of the alerts. And this is the, the other component I like to um, mention, which is sharing. Nice story about sharing. Um, a few years ago, maybe decades ago, I wasn't born, but NASA sent, or was trying to send a probe, uh, the Mars Orbiter, and two engineering teams were not using the same metric and measurement system. One was using the metric system, the other one was using a custom uh, royal system, whatever. The point is that they lost the problem, 125 million, just because they weren't, they weren't sharing the same um, language, the same data, not language as English, but language as what do we rely on to uh, you know, trust the system. So here we are, we can start instrumenting all the things. When we have a proper um, view of the system, when we, we can properly select what we look at, alert and share. 
we can start locally in staging and then go into production. So at this point, I would just like to ask a question to everybody. Um, do you have any monitoring system that you are using for your staging or production environments? This is, okay, cool. So um, I'd like to talk about containers because this is the gist of this conference. So why do we, uh, why do we uh, focus on containers? Containers have been around for a while now, as you might have understood in the last talk, which was pretty amazing. Um, but containers became popular just a few years ago, in my opinion, as the way developers and operation teams work. We have completely shifted of, um, how we do uh, projects. We want to work in some sort of sprints in one of two weeks. Um, and we need to, to deploy. We need to have fast features, incremental um, improvements, and we need to roll back. We can, we're more fault tolerant. And this is what containers are, you know, why containers are so amazing, because they're lightweight, and with containers, you can just test really easily. You can deploy an image, you can kill it, um, you can share. So you, you build a container with your code, so you can, you can share it with uh, other people. And what's great um, is especially how developers get an incentive of the actual infrastructure needs and operation teams get a, a gist of the code that they're actually going to deploy. So I would say that containers are really glue between the dev and the ops. So they're particularly adapted to the DevOps movements. Now, why did uh, containers became famous? Um, maybe it's because of Hacker News. It's a really good site to get, you know, uh, what's up with the in the technology world. But more seriously, I believe that containers became famous because of a um, customer need. We want to monitor everything, and that is we were required to um, to work with the new technologies such as containers. So if people are using containers, that is the way we have to go. And also, uh, as a personal uh, opinion, we have to keep our minds open because containers might be the thing in 2016 and serverless might be the thing in 2017, but you have to comply with what your users are uh, using, actually. So last year, or a few years ago, we conducted a uh, a study about the adoption of Docker, um, because we're curious how people are actually using Docker. So this is from our user base. I'm not going to show you all the amazing facts, but I can show you a few interesting facts that really caught my eye. First, the, the adoption. So we started in July 2014, and uh, in five, uh, in one year, from 2015 to 2016, we saw a 5x growth of the usage, and in one year we saw a 30% growth. So the adoption has not slowed down, it's actually accelerating. Similarly, uh, another nice metric which would be, would be the usage of hosts, or what people are using on their host. So whenever uh, we collect data from hosts of our customers, we are interested in what they are actually using. And we saw that personally, or not personally, but from a our own usage, we went from zero to 10% uh, in two years, and or from 2014 to 2016. And since December, we were almost at 13%. Now, a key metric that I like to show is just the average lifetime of uh, containers. When you have a host that can you can run a few uh, virtual machines on it, uh, that means you are kind of dependent on the OS that is deployed or virtualized if you want to have your applications running. When you can run um, 12 or you know, dozens of containers on the same machine, that means you can easily have isolated applications that are churning much more, so it's easier to test, to deploy, and again, to share. So down the road, it's all about costs. When you can uh, play with your containers, you don't really worry about um, the impact they will have on your physical machine, but rather how you're going to be able to uh, deploy your code, test it, and redeploy if necessary. Now, all of this comes with a few draw drawbacks, of course. Um, the first one being 
we add a layer of abstraction. We, uh, we deploy our code. We don't really know where it is. And this is where monitoring um, you know, takes presence, because we need to identify where is my code running, where is the container running, the specific code running, what is its ID, what is our its resources usage, and that are you know there are a few open questions um, from this particular drawback, questions that we need to answer on a daily basis uh, when when we're trying to monitor everything. So, why where is my container running? Obviously, what's the total capacity of my cluster, the throughput of my app. And the few last questions, I are introducing a core concept of monitoring, which is tagging or um, labeling. When you're, use, when you're collecting data from a web server, um, say Nginx, it's easy to pinpoint that it's coming from this web server. But if, if you have hundreds of web servers, it's really hard and it's necessary to use a tagging system just to say this metric is coming from this web server or even more powerful, you can say these metrics are, are an average of web servers running the version two of, of this application. So this uh, brings me to the core of my presentation, which is um, monitoring and identifying uh, the core elements we want to look at. So what are we after when we, uh, when we use a monitoring tool? Well, as I said earlier, it's really easy to collect metrics. It's really hard or it, it requires a little legwork to identify what we want to look at. Because we want to get the most entropy out of the data that we select. We want to use metrics, we want to use events, logs, um, and service checks, amongst other things. But we want to start correlating each other. So you can have one metric from which you want to have an information. But if you start correlating a metric with another one, you can have another information. And if you cross with an event or a service, uh, service check, you can have another information. And this is where you can start playing um, with you know, a monitoring. I would like to give you a quick example. I assume everybody is familiar with uh, Nginx to web server. Essentially, with, web, uh, with Nginx, you can get uh, many, many metrics uh, from the stub module, or if you're using Nginx Plex, uh, other modules. But the idea is that you have to identify and really break down what you want to look at. Um, just an example, a suggestion I'd like to give is um, work metrics, which could be more business-oriented, uh, such as the request per second, the uh, request time, which is actually, if I'm exposing a page, what is my user going to see? On my end, a resource metrics could be more uh, the actual CPU usage of, um, of my web server or the, the box that is running it, or the memory of the CPU. At this point, I can start playing with metrics among each other. So the request per second, is it tied to uh, the CPU? The more the CPU is running, the more uh, request per second I'm having. Not necessary, but it could be an implication. Now, we also want to play with the, the events. Events are telling a story. And you can play with, for instance, a, um, a service restart with the CPU usage. Because when you want to alert on something, if it's in an abnormal mode, it doesn't mean anything to alert on it. When you start a service, the CPU is not going to be on a regular level. So you want to really correlate everything. And this is how, you know, a concrete example of how you could do that. This representation is just a, uh, you know, the IO weight metric from a, a server over a day. So we see the, each point in time throughout the day. And we overlay, uh, so those ping bars are event overlays. So we can really exploit these events, which could be uh, service restarts or uh, code changes, and identify was my metric affected by these specific uh, chunk of events concrete use case that we use on a daily basis, uh, events from Jenkins. We deploy uh, code, it's accepted, it's in the prod, great. Now, how is this uh, impacting my uh, workload? How is this impacting my databases? How is this impacting my web servers? Or another one, um, the duration of my outage with the deployment of a, another um, code change. This is just a few suggestions that we use on a daily basis. Now, what do we demand from our monitor, monitor tooling, monitoring tooling? First, we need to have a great overview of metrics. 
So how do we define a metric? Just another suggestion could be a really clear name, which is explicit enough. So when we look at it, we can, set, we can identify what it represents, the data points, uh, which is the value that is tied to the timestamp, and finally, the tags. So again, tags are key uh, to monitor, modern monitoring. Just because you can slice and dice and quickly pinpoint across a dimension um, over all my availabilities and over all my roles, database, et cetera, what are the values that I'm looking at? And then we want to we want to discuss with our monitor uh, tooling, our application. We want to say, give me the average of uh, the throughput for Nginx per version, or more interestingly, or as interestingly, the uh, 5x6 errors or responses uh, per data center, per application running the version two. Because with this kind of metric, you can identify is one data center completely crashing and I'm not getting a correct response for my users. And after that, we want to alert. We want to alert and we want to use um, something readable, clear, in context, and more importantly, actionable. This is just an example of uh, what you could do as a message that you would receive should you uh, monitor, in this case, the uh, response time of a home page. So, okay, I'm getting the context, the home page is uh, latency is uh, over three, per three seconds. seconds. Uh, what can I do? So, there are a few steps. This is the actionable um, things I can follow. And we could add something here, so we can call uh, Jenny, but we could also use um, notification for, ex for instance, emails or uh, Slack messages or pager duty incidents to trigger something. There is an outage. Uh, let's look at it. Now let's get into the data. In a containerized world, it's really important to identify what we want. Containers are really different from uh, the, the actual servers because there is a, an inner dynamic and a, an outer uh, movement. Containers are moving and it's hard to pinpoint where things are um, going, you know, going to be in a few seconds. Our first um, suggestion I have is to look at C groups. C groups, uh, as you have heard in the last uh, talk, C groups, they contain the information of the hardware, what's allocated to my container. And this is a great detail because although the kernel is updating the, the results every now and then, you can get the data and you can uh, pull it to have the behavior of your container, identify is it behaving correctly, et cetera. Now, that this was you know, traditional path of where you can find the data. And this is um, an example of what it would look like. So, at this point, you could get the you know, CPU account for user per system uh, or other data. But you could also use what Docker uh, has, which is extremely convenient, is the, uh, the API. So you, you mount the socket, and you can query the HTTP API. Where this gets really handy is that it gives you an idea of how the environment is behaving. You can identify, all right, among the, all the containers, a Redis image was started. Among all the containers, there was an out of memory for this specific container. And when you start getting into the actual data that the, uh, the API makes available, you can get um, all the tagging system completely full. And this is great because when a, a container from which you're pulling data starts um, you know, having an out of memory error, you want to have the image, you want to have the container ID, you want to have all the data details so that when you look at your metrics, you can really identify which container uh, run out of memory. And the other cool feature is uh, events. So on events, you can, um, you, so you can curl the API and you can get the uh, events that occurred in your infrastructure. So, you know, uh, container was started, uh, someone run a, a top or executed in the uh, container, and from this event, we can go back to the Nginx case and overlay the events with the behavior of our metrics so that we can say there was an out of memory and um, the, you know, the container CPU completely dropped, obviously. Now you can cat and curl. Uh, if you have a few containers, uh, that gets a little tricky if you have hundreds or, or thousands of containers. So you can automate that. Uh, we also have, for instance, our agent, which will run as a side container. 
and it will pull metrics from Docker API, from C groups and other um, key elements, and it will pull. Uh, it will push back the data to, our, to your UI so you can graph and have a historical view of it. A great feature I like to talk about is service discovery. Fe service discovery in monitoring is, uh, is kind of key to follow what's going on with my services. If I get the number of requests from a container running Nginx, this container has an ID. Now, if I specifically collect the data from this container, and it dies, it's really hard to, if you don't have any sort of service discovery, it's really hard to continue keeping track of the specific data. So you could rely on events. You could rely on the Docker event saying this container died, and you look at all the uh, metadata of the event, you see uh, it was restarted, it has a new ID, so you can pull the ID and start pulling again your data. You can automate that, and you can have several ways of doing it. Now, concretely, this is what we would have the agent notifies, no, notice that the uh, Nginx container has changed. So it will, given a configuration file, it will start listening to the new container to pull the same data. We talked a lot about infrastructure metrics, um, maybe application metrics, but what's really key into monitoring is also the ability to be flexible. You need to be monitoring custom metrics as well. Why? Because if you want to start collating Infrastructure level data among themselves with events is great, but if you can start including business related data or custom application data, you can really drill into um, is my revenue being impacted by the, the change I made, the shift to use Docker or the number of containers running, or is the duration of my outages um, you know, shrinking because we're using this new application? And this is the, the end of my theoretical call, uh, talk and now I'd like to get into my demo. So I have a friend, it's Martin, he's actually a colleague of mine, great guy. He, a few weeks ago, he loves monitoring like um, many of us, and a few weeks ago I saw him doing a shortcut on his laptop and it opened a, a spreadsheet, input a line with a current timestamp, and then he added a, uh, a task, which you know belongs to a defined set of tasks, say, um, at this time, I uh, called a uh, candidate to, I don't know, have a chat. Or I um, assisted this person to talk about Docker. When I looked at, this, at, at his file, I was like, this is great. Now, how do you really exploit it? How do you go through all this, you know, spreadsheet and you get the, the actual, um, you extract the good data? He told me he has no visualization, and we figured we would just do a quick, you know, in the corner of the table, uh, code that would uh, give him a good visualization. So, a few weeks ago, we worked on that. It just, you know, we just exposed a, a GAN diagram with uh, the tasks that are being stored in a MySQL uh, database. And then I was, I was told that we could go come to this talk, and I was like, that would be actually super interesting to containerize everything. Our uh, PHP box, our MySQL box, our um, Python, Redis, everything. And as we containerize this, I can of course show you how you instrument um, a concrete application. Yes, it's really easy to set up, but it's really interesting to see at the low scale how you can monitor, start monitoring and playing around with this. And also, I could share uh, my Docker Compose file with him. I could just tell him, here you go, this is the GitHub account where I store all the code. You just pull it and then you do docker, up, docker compose up dash D to have it as a daemon, doesn't really matter, but, and then you have your thing working. And that was pretty marvelous. So this is um, the docker compose file. Now I'd like to show you concretely what it looks like, obviously. So, all right. All right, um, now here, is it big enough? Cool. So this is, this is the Docker Compose file. You can see that there are um, different services uh, that are being run. So we pull images from uh, my folder uh, and we tie, uh, we tie the uh, containers amongst each other. So we will run our agent and we'll tell him, you know what, you have to be aware that there will be a DB service which is actually running MySQL so that if we're gonna pull data from it, we don't have to know the IP or use the Docker bridge, we can just use the DBDNS. Or uh, mount the port so we can expose our 
uh, Redis, um, Redis code with the Python kind of application I have here on the port 5000 or you know, MySQL here. And from that, I uh, just go in my terminal here. I'm in, I'm in where the Docker, so you have the Docker Compose file here. And you can do just Docker, of course, Docker Compose uh, D. And it will start booting up all your images. So at this point, if we look at the Docker container we have, if I decrease, just want to make it a little here. Well, you can see that we have a few containers running for our agent, our uh, web server, our DNS, uh, not the DNS, our database, um, or the, the Redis here. And here, from here, we can start actually monitor. So let's execute into this, uh, this container. So docker exec it. Now we are in the container. And what do we have? So we're going to run ps aux into the container. Uh, we can see that there are a few processes being run, including our agent, which is pulling data from everywhere, but I'll get to that later. And at this point, I can um, look at the, um, the file system. So, so here, I'm going to do something cool. Duck, duck. So we can start monitoring. What am I doing here? I'm going to watch the, the activity of our, our C groups for the memory usage and the um, CPU count per, sorry, um, per CPU. As we do that, we'll see that every two seconds, um, these values are being um, updated. Now we can, I, at this point, we started monitoring we're not keeping track of the values in the past, but we can see that every two seconds, we can evaluate is the value expected or uh, should we trigger an alert, et cetera. So this is, this is the, you know, the beginning of monitoring. And the other thing I wanted to do is uh, a, an inspect. So what do we want to inspect? Well, we're going to query the Docker API and given a, the correct uh, path, we want to have the details of a, another, another container running. So say the Redis one here. So if I do that, we have heaps of data. Now, this is not really well formatted, but we can extract interesting things, including uh, the image being run, the status, uh, when it was started, and other environment variables, for instance. We could also look at the stats, stats here. So at this point, we have every now and then, so maybe every two, three seconds, uh, the data being updated for our container running the Redis image. So we can extract values. So you could run like a, a script extracting the values and forwarding them to your um, monitoring system. So this is great. And the last thing I wanted to show you is uh, listening to events. So what we're doing here is just listening to what's going on in, the, uh, in Docker. So here, I'm just changing my screen so I can uh, run some interesting things. So we can do Docker, Docker top here to have uh, here just a, the list of processes, of, well, just a ready server. And if we go back to our um, initial place here, we can see that this event is telling us, oh, uh, someone run a top uh, command. And we can do other things like um, docker restart. Top, of course not, here. And we restarted the Redis container. Now, if we go here, we can see the two events related to stopping the container and restarting it. And at this point in time, we can also store these events. If we have a listener, we can uh, say, all right, these are you know, events coming from the Docker API and the container restarted. How is this impacting my metrics? So what I would love to do is um, have a look at the metrics from this particular container. Well, this is where I'll, I'll just go into my platform for Datadog so I can show you here. 
So this is this is the the Redis application. So it's just a Python app, and it's storing the data. And the other one I would like that I wanted to show you is just here the uh, just the GAN diagram, which is pulling data from uh, from MySQL. Now going to going into our Docker uh, not the Docker our data log account, we can start seeing really interesting things. We can start seeing, uh, amongst other things, the CPU per image that is being used, um, the CPU system, or in terms of memory, <laughs> or in terms of uh, network, the IO, the, the container is being run. And notice that we're only running one agent container. And this agent is aware of the outer dynamics and the inner development. Uh, the inner environment. So we have uh, these events that I stopped and killed the uh, containers. And what can be cool would be just to go into a here, just the, for instance, the uh, MySQL, not MySQL, Nginx. Well, this will do. So here I could say, all right, this is my SQL. What do I want to see? I want to see the event from uh, Docker. And at this point, what could I do? Well, I can scope here. All right, I could see a container was restarted. How is this impacting my MySQL metric? In this case, it won't be really impacting my MySQL metrics because I restarted the Redis container. But I could go further into the event search and say, tell me the events related to um, MySQL. So is my database being restarted out of memory? And I can look at that and see, oh yeah, my metrics are you know, being completely wrecked. So this is visualization. We want to get into monitoring. And what do we want from monitoring? Well, we want to use uh, one of the monitors here. So we're using a metric monitor. And the idea here is to have the Docker CPU usage per container name. So if I go here, I can zoom to show you uh, per container what is the, the CPU usage. Now I can set my you know, thresholds to be alerted and say, oh, all right, hey, Charlie, we're getting famous. Or um, the other, the metric I wanted to actually monitor is the Docker Compose here. Um, here. This is a custom metric that is being collected as, uh, as I refresh my uh, great Redis page here, 1,000. So 12 and here, we have our metric here. So we can say, oh, we are being visited 12 million times. Let's trigger an alert or not. So at this point, we can play around and monitor things. Or we could use other smarter monitors, different kind of monitors, like a uh, here which is a, uh, an outlayer. So we can see at this point that two of, the mon two of the containers are running a CPU that is completely different compared to the rest of the containers running on this host. And my point is, when you start collecting data, you want to have an idea of what you're collecting. You want to have observability, so the choice of the metrics. You want to have the ability to monitor and properly alert, so have you know, heaps of different ways to alert, and then contact the right people, whether it's on a Slack channel, a pager duty event, an outage, or uh, just the mail. Right, I'm just going to go back to here. Uh, here. And I would like to conclude on this, on this thought that monitoring is the full range of um, components, sharing, alerting, monitoring, observing, and uh, being aware of what you're doing. But again, you always have to think about monitoring. I do thank you and welcome questions if you have, uh, or I'll be around for a few hours, but please let me know in French if you want, in English, not in Spanish, not that fluent. En français, a pas de problème.
si on veut que ça soit... <rire> Bonjour. Euh, les métriques, est-ce qu'elles sont récupérées automatiquement en fonction des conteneurs Par exemple, euh, un MySQL va afficher des métriques différentes euh, d'un Nginx Ou est-ce qu'il faut paramétrer euh, Datadog pour ça Très bonne question. Alors, euh, ce qui va se passer, en fait, c'est que l'agent va récupérer des métriques système par défaut. Et en plus de ça, il va avoir les métriques applicatives. C'est-à-dire que si on va faire tourner un container qui tourne Nginx ou MySQL, euh, par défaut, même si c'est sur un host, il va aller euh, récupérer des métriques euh, applicatives de MySQL. Je ne sais pas combien il y a d'euros, de, de combien il y a de l'activité de ma base de données, ou Nginx, combien il y a de 5x6. Maintenant, dans le monde des containers, c'est la magie de service discovery. Ce qu'on va faire, c'est que l'agent va tourner et il va aller écouter sur les événements de Docker. Euh, par définition, on peut lui donner un KV store ou on peut lui donner des, des petits euh, YAML pour lui dire « Si tu vois une image qui s'appelle MySQL, tu vas aller écouter et tu auras cette petite configuration. » Voilà. Et euh, grâce à ça, on écoute les, les événements et on va aller pouler des data euh, automatiquement. Ça veut dire que vous avez une liste de, de conteneurs déjà euh, connus ah, bah, Écoutez, je peux, je peux vous montrer ça tout de suite. Euh, donc, ce que j'ai fait pour, euh, en particulier pour avoir MySQL, donc j'ai euh, tac et autoconf et MySQL. MySQL. Ah. Alors, comme vous pouvez le voir, euh, ce fichier d'autoconfiguration, je l'ai euh, monté sur mon image. Je lui ai dit, si tu vois une image qui s'appelle MySQL, tu vas aller euh, t'intéresser au service DB, donc c'est là où il y a l'importance d'avoir des services plutôt que des, euh, des IP directs, le port, et en particulier, ben, ce, euh, ce, ces credentials. Mais après, par défaut, on va avoir plein, plein, plein de, euh, de YAML qui vont tourner. Par, donc euh, si vous lancez Apache, si vous lancez Redis, donc euh, une, une commande qui peut être sympa aussi que je peux vous montrer. Ah. Um. Ici, Datadog Agent, uh, init. Uh, là. It's init. Uh, Datadog et config check. Alors, euh, là, ce que ça nous dit, ça va dire ce que l'agent a de fait reconnu. Donc, par défaut, il va aller collecter euh, le, la NTP clock, euh, les métriques de disque d'autres métriques système, mais il a remarqué par autoconfiguration que Redis tournait, et donc il a autopopulé euh, l'IP, il va aller euh, récupérer les métriques, de même pour MySQL et pour Nginx. Maintenant, voilà, par défaut, il y a une liste de métriques que nous avons estimé, euh, de métriques, pardon, de files, qui euh, nous avons estimé étaient les containers, les images les plus euh, souvent utilisées, mais euh, vous, soit vous pouvez les monter, alors, en même temps que vous faites de votre Docker Run, euh, soit vous pouvez euh, référencer un KV Store euh, pour le l'agent, soit vous pouvez utiliser les labels aussi. Voilà, c'est plusieurs techniques qu'on a pour faire de, du service discovery qu'on appelle auto-discovery euh, dans notre jargon. Merci. Ah, euh, je, je fais le tour. Hop. Un, deux, un, deux. <rire> Euh, je sais que de base vous êtes plutôt euh, bon élève sur tout ce qui est euh, intégration avec AWS, notamment en particulier sur ce qui est sécurité. Du coup là j'ai remarqué la, surtout le monitoring, de, enfin, sur l'instance Docker qui tourne sur ton Docker, tu as apparemment la possibilité de taper directement sur, le, sur Docker lui-même et de retaper aussi dans les C groups. Donc je suppose qu'à mon avis le, le conteneur il tourne en mode host. Mm -hmm. Est-ce que y avait, vous avez... Euh, Essayer de voir un petit peu comment faire pour restreindre un petit peu les droits au niveau sécurité, pour éviter que ait... un agent de monitoring qui est censé normalement être passif puisse influer sur le fonctionnement des, des conteneurs à côté. Super question. Alors là, on rentre en plein dans le sujet. Euh, C'est une question que j'ai eue récemment pour OpenShift notamment. Je ne sais pas si vous êtes au courant, mais il y a des, problèmes de, il y a des restrictions d'accès, notamment on tourne la socket en route, c'est tout. On n'a pas forcément d'accès en, en host, même si on veut avoir les host paths pour avoir accès au C group, au PID et euh, au process potentiellement. Maintenant, l'accès à la Docker socket, c'est une des façons qu'on a estimées euh, possibles pour, acc pour accéder aux data. 
mais on est en train de travailler, surtout avec Kubernetes, pour ne plus se servir de la, de la Soccer Docket, mais d'utiliser euh, le Kubelet ou euh, l'API Server pour récupérer les données, pour ne plus avoir justement cette euh, dépendance à la Socket en route. Donc voilà, on est en train de travailler sur ça, évidemment.